All right, welcome in. What's right with Nick Wright? Episode 228. A ton to do today. We have two national champions crowned in college sports. The question of, is this the year of the repeat champion? The Chief, uh, At least in the men's side of sports. The Chiefs did it. UConn just did it. What does that mean for the Nuggets? What does that mean for whoever the hell won the Stanley Cup final last year? Nobody knows. You know, those are the types of things, you know, lost to the dustbin of history, I suppose. We'll get into all of it. But first, what missed the cut? John Calipari leaves Kentucky for Arkansas. And then when he's asked about it, he says, I can't because I'm walking my dog. But he was walking his dog in a stroller down a busy street. Little odd end of a ignominious end for Coach Cal at Kentucky. The solar eclipse happened. I got to say it was pretty cool. People at first things first were like, come outside and look. We got the glasses for you. I looked. It was pretty cool. I was like, hey, I'm glad I looked at that. And the (laughs) Curb Your Enthusiasm series finale happened. I have not seen it yet. No spoilers, please. Curb Your Enthusiasm is a show, uh, Demonze, your mother and I have been watching together since the very beginning of our relationship it's still going on and so we have to watch you know well the series finale is and it started before she and i were together it's had 12 seasons but they had like a five-year hiatus between seasons once you this is larry david created seinfeld which was the most successful sitcom ever in the 90s he then created curb your enthusiasm which i think might be the funniest sitcom ever it went on for 12 seasons the series finale but the point is this i can't watch the series finale of a show i've been watching with your mother for our entire lives without her but she falls asleep seven minutes into anything we try to watch (laughs) together we're trying to watch this damn eight episode show on netflix called the gentleman uh, I've seen it. the Guy Ritchie movie. So we're on Demonze. I've been trying to complete episodes seven and eight for two weeks. I'm just watching them four minutes at a time. Then I turn over, I turn, she's falling asleep. I pause it, I turn on poker, and then she's like, Where'd I fall asleep? I'm like, Well, three minutes after you fell asleep on the previous one. So I don't know if I'm ever gonna be able to finish it. Curb, I'm gonna give her a week. I'm gonna give her one week to w- sit down and watch Curb with me because I got to be able to see it. I got to be able to see well, it, and I can't have people spoil the ending unfair of the seven series. Unfair seven days to give a... her. I'll say that. Oh, you, oh, you know what? That's days. a fair point. We do have a wedding <laughs> slash vow renewal uh, happening on Saturday. So that's a good, you know what? Touche. All right, Demonze, <laughs> let's get to the basketball. Go right ahead. All right, let's start off with some college hoops. Uh, The the University of uh, South Carolina capped off their undefeated season on Sunday, and UConn capped off uh, back-to-back titles with another another dominant performance over Purdue. Uh, So we're going to start off with the men's side. Do you think UConn is an all-time great team? So this is tricky because they're the back-to-back champions. They beat everyone in both tournaments by more than a dozen points. They yeah. covered every game. They obviously won every game. Uh, yesterday's game went the way a lot of UConn games have gone, which is the other team feels like they have a chance for the first half, and then UConn just blitzes them in the second half and runs away with it. On the For Purdue, listen, I said on TV that I was rooting for and I was going to go ahead and pick the upset. Uh, and I said Zach Eady, I thought, could have thirty a 38-point double-double is what I predicted. He had a 37-point double-double, and they got dominated. So I, the Eady did his thing. Uh, I don't think it was, despite the numbers, his best game, but I thought he played well. UConn's just too deep and has too much. And if you're Purdue, I, I, I credit to UConn for the game plan of we're going to, listen, if Edie kills us, Edie kills us. We are not going to double off Edie and leave the shooters open. A Purdue team that I'm going to check real quick, but I think for the season shot 40% from three. Uh, and, and I'll get it right in just a second. From the season, yep, shot 40% from three. Last night made one three-pointer. One of seven from three. You have no chance 
of co uh, competing with or beating UConn if you are not just lights out from three. And UConn is, so here's where I struggle with the all-time great team. There is so much variance in a single elimination tournament that this is almost never the case. But I feel like you could have run this tournament 10 times and UConn would have won it eight of them. Like, that's how dominant of a team they were. That's how great they were. So in that regard, versus their contemporary competition, yes, of course, they're an all-time great team. But in regards to how would this UConn team stack up against the great teams of yesteryear college basketball, they would get annihilated. So because college basketball has just changed so much. Because guys don't, the best players are not there. They don't stay for long enough. You don't have multiple great pros. Even the last back-to-back -back national champion uh, in college basketball, Florida, if you look at who they had on, and that was 15 years ago, who that Florida team had on its 06 and 07 teams, they had the following guys who were big-time NBA players. Joe Kim Noah, Torian Green, Corey Brewer, and Al Horford. So you had oh, yeah. a four of your starting five, as, and then they came back the next year, DeMonze, yeah, they won did it again. again, and they added Maurice Spates off the bench, Chris Richard, who had a cup of coffee in the NBA. But when you've got, you know, Horford, Brewer, Noah, and Torian Green – all in your starting five, like that is just a legendary team. You look at UConn, the UConn team that uh, won it in 99. Let me pull up who was on that team at, just to give you some context for it. So the 99 UConn team had Rip Hamilton, obviously, Khalid el and Jake Voschel, uh, who, again, not great NBA players, but NBA players all over it. The... The UNLV team, what UNLV team, what year won it? I, I don't know if it's 92 or 93. Uh, but the, if you look at that UNLV team and you're like, oh, okay, how, or it's 90, pardon me. Who did they have? They had Stacey Augman, Greg Anthony, and Larry Johnson. The Michigan team that didn't win the national championship, the Jalen, like the, the Fab Five team, DeMonze, that Michigan team had. Let me tell you who they had. They had Jalen Rose, Jawan Howard, Jimmy King, uh, and Chris Weber on it. So, like, how it is very difficult, and I'm leaving someone out. Who am I leaving out? Uh, oh, Ray Jackson didn't play in the league. Uh, so, it's just very difficult to comp modern college basketball to previous college basketball. They had an unbelievable line, DeMonze, in the... Uh, in at the beginning of the the game, which was this is the first national championship game that's a matchup between seven footers since 1984. Those seven footers, Demonze, were pa or 1984. Did I say 74? 1984. Those seven footers were Patrick Ewing and Akeem Olajuwon. <laughs> Those two guys played each other in a national championship game. And so I'm not taking a thing away from UConn, nothing. And in modern college basketball, it is an all-time legendary team. There is no argument about it. It is not a historic team. Uh, and now I want to talk about Edie and Purdue. Because Zach Edie, this tournament, I, I have been very skeptical of him as a pro because he's not going to be able to defend on the perimeter modern college basketball and what it demands of you as a big man. But here's what he did in the NCAA tournament. 30 and 21 round one, 23 and 14 round two, 27 and 14 round three. 40 and 16 to get to the final four, 20 and 12 in the semifinal, 
and then 37 and 10 in the national championship game against a guy that in the national championship game, a fellow seven footer guy who was seven two. If you can get him on a team, Demonze, like Miami, that has a rim that has a rim protector who can guard on the perimeter and bam, and he can add some all he can. You know, Bam can kind of extend the floor, but he's not the greatest shooter in the world. I understand that. But, and Edie can play down low. I think there's a place for him. And I know some people have said, what about on the Spurs? Just try to create like the craziest, longest team. And Wimby's playing out on the perimeter. He's down low. So I think there's a place for him in the NBA. And I didn't think that before the tournament. I also think this tournament generated one of the worst sports takes of the year by frenemy of the show, Draymond Green. Mm. When Draymond tweeted last night, job well done, 35, for UConn. You did your job tonight. It was him that made Edie quit with 19 minutes to go in the second half. There was a turnover, and I saw Edie's body language walking back. He was done. Now rewatch the game from that point on. Hashtag free game. So for some context there, that number 35 that Draymond is talking about is Stanley Johnson. Stanley Johnson last night played five minutes and had five fouls in those five minutes because he couldn't contain Edie because he's just not big enough. Edie last night was... Ex- He played every second of the game until they took guys out at the very, very end. He played 39 to 40 minutes at 7 foot 4. Were there times he was exhausted? Sure. Were there times in the second half where he seemed a little discouraged? Of course, because UConn was running away with it. But the idea that Zach Eady quit in that basketball game is so absurd and such facile reasoning and to me that is motivated reasoning meaning Draymond was trying to do multiple things there one be like here's the game within the game that you casuals aren't picking up on two give credit to a guy whose box score looked like trash to be like that guy actually had as much impact as the guy who had 37 and 10. Now you tell me who that type of player that like that credit would extrapolate to amongst other players and you can see why maybe it was Draymond's take. I thought Edie should hang his head, should not hang his head at all and be very proud of how he played in this game and in this tournament. Now to the women's 100%. side of thing, things, DeMond said. The, yeah, so the women's side, uh, Caitlin Clark ends her college career with a strong case for the GOAT despite not winning a ring. So she did carry a team of nobodies back-to-back to championships. Or not to championships, not, but far into the to tournament. To the championship game. Yeah, right. yeah to the, to the uh, final in both cases. Yeah, exa- exa- that, that's got to sound pretty familiar to you with uh, LeBron. <laughs> And Patrick Mahomes, is that the reason why you like her so much? Well, I think the it's a LeBron question, which is like the 07 or the 18 Cavs, you lose in the finals, but you carry a team there. And I it's not why I like her so much, but I do think it is a unique way to look at, like it just, does Caitlin Clark have to have won a title? in order to be the greatest woman's player of all time. So here is the comp I will give. The the most decorated women's basketball player of all time is Brianna Stewart. Brianna Stewart played four years at UConn. They won four national championships. She won player of the year three times. Her final three years there, Demonze, they were 116-1. and one. All right? So, how can anyone trump that? And the answer is, on a base level, you can't. But then I give you this piece of information. The year after Brianna Stewart left UConn, they went into the Final Four, 36-0. Lost by two points in overtime 
in the Final Four to finish the year 36-1 and without her. The year after that, they went into the Final Four 36-0, and lost by four points in overtime in the Final Four to finish the year 36-1. and So they were 116-1 and in her final three years. They were 72-2 and in the next two years without her, and both of those losses were by a combined six points in overtime in the Final Four, which is not to say Brianna Stewart is not arguably the GOAT, but the, team the was context amazing. of the <laughs> overwhelming juggernauts, uh, juggernaut that that UConn team had turned into, right? And so I watched the Women's National Championship game, and I asked myself this question. Is there a single player on Iowa other than Caitlin Clark that would get a single minute of playing time for South Carolina? My answer to that question is no. South Carolina went nine deep, and if you were to stack up the ten best players in that, you know, on those two teams, it would be Caitlin Clark one, and two through ten would be South Carolina Gamecocks. You then add, there is then also this element of that I, so last, so South Carolina in its last 81 games has won, or 82 games, maybe 80, I think it's 81 games, is 80 and one, right? With two national championships. The one loss is to Caitlin Clark in Iowa in the final four last year when Caitlin dropped 40. In a weird way, Demonze, I think her beating South Carolina hurt her in the GOAT discussion. Because had she lost that game and then lost to them in the national championship, as opposed to beating them and then losing to LSU, I think people would be like, well, South Carolina is on an 82-game winning streak. They've won three straight titles. No one was beating them. They're an overwhelming juggernaut. But because she pierced kind of their invincibility and then lost in the next round, it damn it, 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 I think some people will use that against her. Now, there is a give and take in everything. If she were on a better team, Demonze, she probably wouldn't have the stats and the records that she has now if it was a more well-rounded team. And so because of that, to me... And because there is no obvious, clear-cut, undoubted goat of women's college basketball like there is in men's college basketball, with it being Lou Alcindor, then Kareem, I, because Cheryl Miller has obviously a super strong argument. Tarazi is the best player I had ever seen before Caitlin. Shamiqua holds claw in the '90s. Brianna Stewart. All those people are, Maya Moore, they're all in the room, and Caitlin's in that room. I do ask this question. In my lifetime, have I ever seen a women's college basketball player better than Caitlin Clark? And the answer to that question is no. She's the best I've ever seen. And does that make her the GOAT? That's a argument for others to have. Now, on the South Carolina side of things, do you want to say something to Monza, or can I go to South Carolina? No, 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 you can go to South Carolina. I think it's... I th- I think it's a tricky debate, but uh, but yeah, I don't. You you got it. You got it. I think it's a, the, the. I mean, I think she's. A, I think dismissing. I think in pro sports, if you've never won a championship, I think it's disqualifying because you have a you have fifteen twenty years to do it. Right. In college sports, when you have four years and the teams can be so lopsided, I don't think it's disqualifying. Now to South Carolina. Shout out to Dawn Staley, man. Dawn Staley got there in 09. They were 10 and 18 her first year. Won the first won her first SEC title five years later. The year after that made the final four in 2015. 2017 won her first championship. 2020 was 32 and 1, and the pandemic hits probably robbed her of a championship. In 2022, won the title. In 2023, was undefeated going into the Final Four, lost a heartbreaker to Caitlin Clark, and in 2024, undefeated, ran the table. Unbelievable run, unbelievable depth, not one 
like last year when she had Aaliyah Boston, the number one pick of the WNBA draft, not one just like superstar player, head and shoulders above everybody else, and found a way to do it. And I am I am really, really impressed by what she was able to do and by that team. And I do wonder if there is going to be how much how many programs on the men's side of things are going to try to poach her. I think Kentucky should call her with Coach Cal leaving. I think she absolutely can coach basketball, men's or women's. And I think Kentucky should have a real conversation about whether or not they want to try to bowl her over with unbelievable money, which they could do. Um, Or she could stay at South Carolina. And as we've seen in the past, like – you can go on uh, a run in women's college basketball kind of unlike any other sport. Like, the Lady Vols in, it was the uh, the Lady Vol era when I was a kid, then it was the UConn women's era, and then it was, now it's the South Carolina era. But the Lady Vols, Demonze, they won the title in 87, 89, 91, 96, 97, 98, and were the runner-up in 95, 2000, 03, 04. Okay? And then, by the way, they won two more in 07, 08. Um, then right. UConn took over uh, in basically 2000, and UConn won the title in 2000, 02, 03, 04, 09, 2010, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016. That was UConn's run. And now South Carolina, 17, I would, con- nobody won the title in 20. They would have. 22, 24, and were undefeated going into the Final Four in 23. They can keep this thing rolling as long as Dawn Staley stays there. All right, let's move on next. 100%. Um, So Dallas has won 10 of their last 11 games. Seems like they're peaking at the right time, and it seems like they they also ended Houston's uh, season on Sunday on the back of Kyrie's 48 points in double overtime. Kyrie and Lucas have proven to be the best one-two puncher, one of the best one-two punchers in the NBA. Where would you rank them in the one-two punches going into the playoffs? I, listen, they're as dangerous as anybody. And whomever gets the one seed in the West is has reason to be scared of them. That, and that's not necessarily... Why are you laughing? You think that's a Denver thing? No, no. I think, you know I think that's, that's... No, no, no. That's, that's definitely... That's fair. But, I mean, I think if, if Luka is seeing Denver in the first, in the first round... I don't no, think it'd he's, be the second round. The second round, yeah, I don't I'm, think that. Because, well, here's what I'm saying. Right now, we don't know who's going to be the one seed in the West because Minnesota and Denver are tied and Oklahoma City's a game behind, all right? Dallas is going to be the four or the five seed, and they're going to play the Clippers in round one, and Dallas is going to rock the Clippers in round one, okay? Whoever is the one, I don't think you want to play Dallas right now. Luka is a legendary playoff performer already. Um, Everyone gives me a hard time about it, uh, but it's just the facts. Luka, his career playoff numbers are as follows. Year one against the best Clippers team that ever existed, the bubble Clippers team, his first playoffs ever, he he averages 31, 10, and 9. Year two in the playoffs against that same Clippers team, he averages 36, 8, and 10. Again, those are two series with Kawhi and Paul George guarding him on basically every possession. Year three, going through Utah and then Phoenix and then losing to Golden State, he averages 32, 10, and 6. So for his career in the playoffs, He's 33, 9, and 8. 
He is a legend in the postseason. Kyrie, who obviously I've been critical of over the last few years, is having one of the best seasons of his career, is doing everything we all have always asked of him, keeping the nonsense to the side, being mostly available. He and Luca's chemistry is off the charts and just a dynamic, dynamic offensive force right now this year you're getting all of the good of Kyrie with none of the bad he's 26 percent or 26 percent 26 five and five for the year on 50 41 wow he's all he's this close to a 50 40 90 season he's 49.6 for the year so he's gonna just barely miss out on a 50 40 90 year uh and Dallas is super dangerous, man. And it, yeah. for if you are Denver, this Denver is the overwhelming favorite for a reason. And the one seed could be decided tomorrow night when you have Nuggets, T Wolves in Denver. If Jamal Murray is not at a hundred percent, Denver can get got in this postseason. With Jamal it's Murray, I don't know stuff. who's beating him. Yeah, I mean he's back now. Right. But if he is, and I think they're being very cautious with him, which they should be. But Dallas right. is a dangerous, dangerous team. And if if the Lakers, and we'll get to the Lakers in a minute, can somehow move up to the seven line. My ideal bracket at this point is as follows. Denver 1, OKC 2, Minnesota 3. Dallas Clippers 4-5, who cares? By 4 or 4-5, doesn't matter. My ideal realistic bracket, I should say. Um, Phoenix 6, Pelicans slash Kings, whomever, 7, Lakers 8, the other one, whatever. The Lakers end up with OKC in round 1. Knock them off. The Mavs end up with Denver in round two. The Mavs beat Denver for the Lakers, who can't beat Denver. <laughs> and then we get a Luka LeBron Western Conference Finals if the Lakers can get there. It's not a likely dream, but the dream is alive. The dream yeah, is alive of a Luka LeBron Western Conference Finals. Kyrie against LeBron, eight, the whole thing. AD playing some of the best basketball of his career. If he can stop getting hit in the face, that's what I'm pulling for. All right, next. All right, so the Bucks have been on a terrible slide, uh, terrible slide lately, losing to the Wizards, Grizzlies, and the Raptors. Uh, most recently, they made it four straight, losing to the Knicks. So they're about to play my Celtics uh, tonight, actually. And do you think this is a must win to boost morale and get back on track, or is this a so listen, the Bucks. there is no defending how the Bucks have been playing, what Doc's been saying. They look like a mess. Jeez. I understand they haven't had Giannis and Dame for all these games, but they did have them both for the Knicks game. They got beat soundly anyway. At this point, I'm Knicks going full-on galaxy brain on the Bucks, which is they want to drop out of the two seed. They want to be the three because they want to duck Philly in round one. That's a good galaxy brain. Appreciate that, guys. Philly right now, is, it looks like is going to be in the play-in and going to win that first play-in game and be the seven. Philly looks devastating right now. They just won a great game without Maxi, a great comeback. They Embiid's playing great. And so I think, I think Milwaukee wants to fall to the three line, get Indiana or the absolutely collapsing Cavs in round one, regroup, and then see what's what in round two, playing either uh, or p playing probably Philadelphia in round two after Philadelphia has clipped the Magic. That's what I'm rooting for. The Bucks were my pick to win the championship. Yeah, it is not looking ask. good. I can't even really justify it right now. <laughs> I, I'm just going to believe that Giannis is going to play better and that Doc's going to coach better. But right now it doesn't Doc's look Doc's going to coach Next. better. Um, it's not LeBron, great. It's not great. LeBron versus Steph, part of millions coming up tonight. Uh, the Lakers are rolling, and a win can help them win, uh, climb into the 7-8 play-in game. 
But if they do stay in the nine seed, LeBron has a chance to beat Steph in an elimination game. Are you secretly hoping for that so you can add another line to uh, to your GOAT's legacy? No. Listen, here's the deal. I The Lakers need to move up a line. And the loss to the Timberwolves killed them. And it, despite it's their only loss in like a couple weeks, but it still was just devastating. And it just sucked. Like LeBron was out for the game because he was he was sick. A, they were up after the first quarter. AD gets hit in the face, and they just get rolled. Um, so here is the scenario for the Lakers. To move up one line, they need to win out. All right, there's three games left. They have to beat the Warriors. Tough game, but it's in L.A. The Lakers have been great in Los Angeles. At the Grizzlies, no problem. And then at the Pelicans in the final game of the year, which could be almost like a playoff game. If you assume the Lakers win out, they then move up if any of the following happens, okay? If the Kings lose twice, the Kings' schedule is at the Thunder, home for the Pelicans, home for the Suns, home for the Blazers. Or if the Pelicans lose twice, but keep in mind, one of those losses is baked in to this scenario because it, the Lakers would be playing them. The Pelicans right. are at the Kings, at the Warriors, and then home for the Lakers. And the Pelicans, by the way, have been in a bit of a free fall. They steadied themselves with a win against the Suns. Or if the Suns lose twice, the Suns have home for the Clippers at the Clippers, at the Kings, at the Timberwolves. So if the Lakers win out, I think they move up. To your point on, would it be a bit of a silver lining if they don't, that LeBron beat Steph in the play-in once, a couple years later eliminated him in round two last year, and then could beat him in the 9-10 play-in game? Sure, but not enough of a silver lining because you can't be in the 9-10 part of it because then you got to win, then you got to win a road game, and then you start on the road, obviously, in a best of seven if you get through those two games against the one seed that's been resting for a week. So the Lakers need to go three. If the Lakers go 3-0, and I think one of those scenarios is going to happen because those teams above them play each other enough that one of them's going to get a couple losses. And so... That's the scenario for the Lakers. I believe it's going to... I believe the Lakers are going to, on the final day of the season, beat the Pelicans to move up to the 7-8 game. I, I believe that's going to happen. They're going to finish the year 48-34, and 34, uh, potentially tied with New Orleans, and they would have the tiebreaker with New Orleans. That's the scenario that I am looking for. But it's so weird because right now the Lakers could absolutely finish. There are, let me check basketball references playoff odds. Um, the Right now the Lakers have a 3% chance to be the sixth seed, a 9% chance... To be, this isn't for, you know, pre-playing. The 7. A 17% chance to be the 8. A 41% chance to be the 9. And a 30% chance to be the 10. And that is basically they lose tonight and they're cooked on that front probably. So, we have three games left. And 6 through 10 are all in play for them. And that is the same, by the way, for... The Warriors are basically locked into either 9 or 10. But the Kings can be anywhere from 6 through 10. The Suns can be anywhere from 6 through 9. And the Pelicans can be anywhere from 6 through 8, realistically. Maybe 6 through 9 as well. It's just a wild how close it is at the end of the season here. All right, take a quick break, come back, and do Demonze's favorite segment of the year. That's next, What's Right. All 
All right, welcome back in. What's right with Nick Wright? Uh, before we get to this or that, time now, Demonze. You know what time of year it is. Do you hear the birds chirping? Do you hear the sm soothing tones of Jim Nance's voice? Can you taste the pimento in your mouth slightly? Oh, yeah. The azalea's blooming. It's time for our master's corner. Go right ahead. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> the Masters is underway uh, in Augusta, and Scotty Scheffler, or Scheffler is the favorite. Break it down while I watch some grass grow. Oh, buddy. So here's the thing. So this is a big weekend, right? Because my wife and I, April 13th is our anniversary, and we're renewing our vows, which is actually a full-blown wedding. 150 people. A full-blown ceremony. Um, the great mayor of Kansas City is doing it for me. Is he, He's the officiant. Uh, he's a, you got bridesmaids, groomsmen. Demonze's getting fitted for a tux. A full thing. And I try to be, you know, I got a lot of balls in the air that I got to, you know, keep keep a lot of people happy at different times. And I feel honestly terribly about scheduling a major event, asking people to travel, potentially asking people to be on an airplane Sunday afternoon flying home for the during the final round of the Masters. However, April 13th is my literal anniversary and it falls on a Saturday, so there was no real wiggle room about doing it a week later. Like, if April 13th had fallen on a Tuesday, then it's like, oh, we're not going to be able to do it on the day either way. So, I've got some good news for you, buddy. Because, sat, you know, you are co-best man along with friend of the pod, Danny Parkins. Saturday morning, while the ladies are getting ready and getting dressed and doing all that, and we have some extra time, we're all, you know what our Saturday morning uh, wedding activity is? We're watching the Masters. Oh, it's gonna be great! It's gonna be great. And the ceremony. Listen, we're gonna have. We're gonna miss obviously. <laughs> uh, the you know the end of day three because we will be the ceremony will be going on, and then Sunday, open schedules for everyone. Danielle's like, do you want to play anything? I'm like, nah. Give people their own day. Like we don't have to have any post wedding stuff. You know why? Oh my goodness gracious! Sunday at Augusta. And so that's you and me locked in for it. And you have no choice because this is a family weekend. It's a me and your mom weekend. And so you are on my side of things. So you're going to be locked right in there with me. And I'm, I, I got a prediction. You're going to be hooked after this weekend because the other thing that's going to be happening Saturday morning, we're going to be putting in some bets, my friend. We're going to be – and golf gambling, oh, my goodness. Because it's all – there are all of it, Demonze, all of it's going to feel like – a six-team parlay because there's so many golfers, you get great odds on everything. So my big pre-masters bet, oh mark it in now, Xander Shoffley, 20 to 1 to win the Masters. He has the profile of a guy that absolutely can win this tournament. His game fits, fits Augusta National perfectly. He finished second five years ago. He's one of the best active golfers without a major. He's got a top three at the Masters, at the Open, and the U.S. Open. And I understand everybody's going to be on Scotty Scheffler, and Scotty Scheffler is the rightful favorite. What are you? What are you looking at? What is? Go oh, you're literally watching grass grow. This is unbelievable. This is unbelievable. Here unbelievably insulting what you're doing this is one of the greatest sporting events of the year pal so, the, the yeah. augusta national i can't wait and friday oh boy oh we're gonna be together friday too yeah, friday we're gonna be able to watch oh my goodness gracious this is oh. so and T tiger trying to break the record for cuts made oh you know what i did yesterday yesterday i took 
This is what we call, I think this is what people your age call self-care. Does Tiger Woods keep coming I back, took, dude? How old is he? I, I, he comes back for the Masters. Um, but I think this is what people your age call self-care to watch. Yesterday, I carved out about 30 minutes of my day to watch a cut-up of one of the greatest back nines in golf history, Jack at the 86 Masters in his mid-40s going eagle birdie birdie on 15 16 17 to shockingly win his final major a legendary performance could we see something like that from tiger this time probably not tiger if you want to bet on him by the way he's a nice tidy 120 to 1 but we're going to put our money on xander and we're going to go with the x man to win the masters let's go so excited Lock, Lock it, in. it in. And out of respect to the Masters Tournament, executive decision right now. My guy Jake here at Trentage is going to be happy. The Blue Duck folks are going to be happy. Demonze is going to be happy. Out of respect to the Masters Tournament, we're canceling Thursday's pod. Yeah, you can't be watching me when you can watch the opening rounds on the Masters app. Create your own foursome. Watch every shot. Oh, my goodness. Best app in sports, by the way. Demonze, download it now. It's it's useful. Four days a year. Best app in sports. Every single shot the moment it comes in. Right to your phone. Crystal clear 4K. It's free. There's no ads. I don't know how they do it. All right, let's play this or that. I feel like... Uh... All what? right, guys. What? Nothing, nothing. I was just going to say, I've nothing. I feel like you suck at golden tea. I feel like I kick your butt in golden tea. With all this, all this right. golf. No problem. Got. We're going to be in Kansas like City. Should, Grand yeah, Falloon on the plaza where I where I made my bones in golden tea. I will whoop your ass in golden tea. We will put real money on it. I'm not a golden <laughs> tea pro like some of those guys where you have your own golfer and like you're competing with right. other golden tea pros. But me versus an amateur, me versus someone that doesn't understand. You have, uh, the, you have no much. You have no idea how much golden tea I played when I lived in Kansas City and was building fences every day. You have no idea. Um, uh, but you know what? That's a good point. <laughs> And I bet some of those fence builders are big time golden tea guys. Tom I takes it very are, seriously. Like, he's like, on the he, top he of the leaderboard. He has his own and golfer. And all of a sudden, it's like, wait, th why, where did this character come from? Why does he have a <laughs> rainbow hat on and and wearing knickers? Or like he's from Scotland and he's just banging. Yeah, no, I know those guys. Those guys are great. Give me a picture uh, of Coors Light in about 90 minutes. Exa exactly. Beer team. on the machine. Oh, God. <laughs> that is a dream. I got to tell you, there is like an alternate life that I wonder. Like, what if I had just been like a mailman and I just have my nine-hour job and then after work I hit up my local bar. I just crush it darts, golden tea, <laughs> billiards, no after work. I, I'm not going on nice vacations. I'm not eating great meals, but I'm just living. That part of me, that might be retirement for me. Retirement yeah. for me might Get just be. Get a golden be... tea machine. Oh, a golden tea. No, I don't want gold. Yeah, a golden tea. We have a Pac-Man and we have Big Buck Hunter. Big Buck Hunter. I used to be top 1% in the world at the Grand Falloon in Kansas City with my roommate Garrett when I was living that life you were living when you were selling fences. This was when your mom <laughs> and I met each other when she first came over to the apartment that I lived in with Garrett and she told me, if we're going to continue this relationship, you have to move. This is the most disgusting place I've ever been in my life. And I promptly moved. We would go to the Grand Falloon on the plaza and just wreck shop in Big Buck Hunter. Oh my goodness gracious! Those were the days. Your oh, early twenties, guys. It's just yeah, uh, you know, try to try to keep the pop to Achilles to under one and a half. But aside <laughs> from that, you really can't do wrong. What a life! Oh, I I'd trade it all, Demonze. Oh uh, to, to Go back, relive it. All right, let's play this or that. <laughs> Yo, the 76ers and Spurs went to double overtime Sunday. Wimby did Wimby stuff, dropping 38, 18, seven, had seven blocks and five threes. Jeez. Uh, Maxi on the other side, dropped a career-high 52 in the win. 
The more impressive performance was Wimby or Maxi. Uh, I, I, that's a tie. Maxi's played 52 minutes and was just never tired and just could get to the rim at will. When Maxi's rolling, he is such a fascinating player because he just seems faster than everyone. He is, he is. He doesn't He's seem speedy. like the greatest athlete. He just seems faster than everyone. And I might have been a little too low on Wimby. He's, he's pretty impressive. <laughs> uh, he's pretty impressive. Uh, I mean, I is he already one of the 20 best players in the league? Yeah, probably. Uh, and so, I and that, he's really... That number, I was really like 86%. Impressive. Like I was saying, he's got more blocks than 80%, 86% of the league. And you were like, that's probably skewed because, you know, all the players on the bench. I'm pretty sure that number has gone up. And I think the number, like, of... Uh, of all time NBA players is also going up. Like it's probably going 82, 86, oh. 82, 87. Oh, it's, I mean, he's getting I, three, four blocks a game. I don't know what his average is, but hey, man, it's unbelievable. It's it's usual. It's unbelievable. Um, but all right, you, let's go to the did you next catch, question. Did you did you see his logo? What do you think of it? Did I did see. Is that confirmed? Is that? Oh, that's Nike's actual tweet. Okay, that's a dope logo. Right. I gotta say that is a dope logo. I and I like the with Nike's smart man. Not you, hot take. Nike's marketing department, A+. plus. All right, next. Actual uh, next, not the stupid Matt Ford trying to get us to talk about if aliens are real. Matt, we're doing a professional <laughs> show here. Let's go. Not so, not so many people saw this coming before the season, but the Orlando Magic are currently sitting in the three seed. Something else no one saw coming. The once mighty Warriors celebrating the 10 seed. Yikes. Yeah, that's embarrassing. Um, yeah, so you see the yeah. picture up there on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, the more shocking yeah. thing is Magic being the three seed or the Warriors celebrating a play-in berth. Uh, Orlando being the three with a real chance because they play Milwaukee twice in the final week of being the two seed is more shocking. The Warriors celebrating the ten seed is just sad. And just like Draymond being like, oh, we showed you, Tari Eason. We ended your season. Bro, you're a dynasty. You're like, yeah, right. with a t give me a break. All right, next. He's talking like the Rockets. Uh, reports are that Michael Parsons has worn thin in Dallas and that people in the organization will be smiling or breathing a sigh of relief if Parsons was gone. Meanwhile, Dak's future is very much in question. Who's out first, Parsons or Dak? Smiling if Michael left uh, the building. Yeah, I mean, I mean, whoever said this is just so out of their mind. Guys... <laughs> You have a 24-year-old superstar. Do you know what your job is if you have a 20-something-year-old multimillionaire who is one of the best in the world at what he does manage him? That's the job. That, as Dom Draper would say, that's what the money's for. The idea that, oh, Mike is a pain in the ass, and that's what you're paid for, is to mitigate that. Like, shut up. He's great what is he at his even job. doing to where, like... Exactly. That's what I'm saying. It'd be one thing if it's, like, the guys out here getting arrested doing... The, he's not doing... <laughs> what? His podcast annoys you? He's being Give annoying. me a break. I mean, it's, just, it's, so, it's such an outrageous thing. Mike is going to be there long term. Dak, this could be Dak's last year. So the answer to that question uh, is Dak. I want to skip the Bronny question because that, that's too long form. Like, there's a lot of layers to the Bronny stuff that we can discuss. Uh, I don't want to give it the short short shrift here. So let's skip the Bronny question and go to the NBA, the full NBA question. All right, after a night off of the NBA, uh, either because of the national championship or the eclipse, I'm not quite sure. NBA basketball reti returns in full force with 14 games tonight. 14 NBA games in one night is too much or too little, or not enough, sorry. Well, it's obviously too much, um, but they the in uh, uh, while the NFL is just out here elbowing the NBA off corners it previously had, like hey we're Christmas Day, nope it's ours now. Hey we're MLK Day, nope it's ours now. The NBA stays its gracious self and is like we're not we're going to keep the tradition of not having pro basketball on the night of the national championship game. We're just not going to do it. And because of that, that then makes tonight a super pack slate. All right, quick break right back with your questions and our answers. What's right? All 
All right, welcome back in. What's right with Nick Wright? Demonze, let's get to these questions. Mac Pross asks, Nick, have you ever been to the Masters? What do you think about the course? I've never been to the Masters. If anyone who has it, you know, this is one of those things. If there is a total stranger listening that is a fan of the show and wants to invite me next year, I will go. I, I don't need to know you. I, I'm not <laughs> concerned. Like, we can, we can become very good friends if anyone wants to invite me to go to the Masters next year. I obviously will pay my own way for everything, but if anyone has access to Saturday, Sunday at Augusta and would like to invite me for a day or two, I'm in. I've never been. At some point, I'll go. At some point, maybe I'll have enough juice to where I can get the do- the dockets my su- the ducats myself. I don't have that yet. So if anyone out there wants to invite me, I'll go. Next, um, Justin Rimpy asks Nick, will any Chiefs oh, don't players? Answer. No, don't, 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 don't ask that question. Will Sorry, any Justin Chiefs... Rimpy. Was... No, Ryan don't Fitzgerald. Ask that there you go. Thank yeah, you. No, no, no. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. Ryan Fitzgerald, question for Nick. More impressive recent dominant Chiefs or UConn men's basketball? Well, UConn's definitely been more dominant. UConn's won every tournament game by a dozen points. They've covered every spread. I the UConn's been more dominant against their competition. It, it, UConn's been the most do- UConn men's basketball and South Carolina women's basketball the last couple of years have been the most dominant forces in sports across the board. Uh, let's go to Clark. Um, Clark, Clark Nebrez asked, Nebrez asked Nick, if the Hawks know. trade someone in the offseason, who among their two guards should it be? I think they're going to trade Trey Young. Uh, I think Trey Young is the guy they're going to trade, maybe to the Lakers, I don't know, but I think I think that's who they're going to that's who they're going to trade. Trade. All right, next. Derek Brooks said, question for Nick. What do you think about the in-season tournament winner that finished 7 through 10? Getting the sixth seed, this would get them out of the play-in uh, as an incentive. The prob- I, like, I've heard some people like, if you win the in-season tournament, you're automatically in the playoffs. The problem with that is then it would potentially lead to a team, you know, just coasting or resting guys. For a month leading up to the playoffs. And so that's not uh, the right answer. I do think you could do more than just a financial incentive. But I don't think you can give an automatic playoff berth. All right, good show. Off on Thursday in celebration of the Masters. Demonze, can't wait to see you in Kansas City. I'll see you guys on What's Right next week. I'm on with Colin in 90 Minutes. Uh, I have our show uh, at 3 o'clock Eastern. See you guys there. What's right? Take care, guys. Hey, thanks for watching. If you're still here, do me a favor. Hit the subscribe button, then hit the bell so you can be notified when we have new episodes. After you've done that, one more favor. Go to your favorite audio platform of choice and subscribe there as well. Don't forget, we're live every Tuesday and Thursday, 1030 a.m. Eastern-ish. 10.35, 10.40, it sometimes changes, but that's why you hit the bell. You hit the bell so you're notified. You subscribe so we can get to 200,000 followers. We're right around 150,000. We'd love to get to 200,000, get Demonze another plaque. So like, subscribe, rate, send a rating too. Do all that cool stuff. Thanks, guys.